often claimed that the Bible should be dismissed as being just a religious book. However, the Bible is much more than a religious book. It is also a book of history. In fact, 22 Old Testament books and five New Testament books deal at least in part with history. The books of the Old Testament are Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Numbers, Judges, Ruth, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, and Jonah. The books in the New Testament are Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. If the Bible is the Word of God, we should expect its presentation of history to be accurate. So the questions before us are, is the Bible supported by secular recorded history? And is the Bible supported by archaeology? What follows is a discussion of the evidence supporting the biblical view of history. A major source of criticism against the Bible is that it disagrees with some modern claims about ancient history. This results in part from a secular presupposition that the Bible is wrong unless proven correct to the satisfaction of God-hating scoffers who assume the Bible to be largely Bronze Age mythology. The reason for this is that secular historians usually start with a materialistic, naturalistic, atheistic view of history. By definition, a materialistic, naturalistic, atheistic view of history assumes that miracles are impossible. As such, since the biblical account of history has lots of miracles, it is excluded as a starting assumption. As a result, a materialistic, naturalistic, atheistic view of history is not going to agree with the Bible, no matter what the evidence is. A major source of difficulty is the standard Egyptian history, which has such disagreement with the Bible that it is routinely used to attack the Bible. There are two types of science, operational science and historical science. Observational science involves determining how things happen in the present based on direct observation and experimentation. Historical science, on the other hand, involves determining what happened in the past by indirect observations in the present and not based on observations made of the past. This does not necessarily invalidate historical science, but it makes historical and operational science different types of processes. One of the problems faced by historical science is the fact that the further you are looking back in time, the worse the preservation of evidence and the increase of the number of variables. The result is that historical science is far more susceptible to conjecture and philosophical assumptions. While operational science is not totally immune to conjecture and philosophical assumptions, they are less of an influence because its observations and experimentation deal with the present and the results are the results. Sooner or later, erroneous conjectures and philosophical assumptions in operational science will be shown false no matter how cherished they may be. On the other hand, historical science is always dealing with incomplete evidence, and this forces a need to fill in the gaps with a theoretical system that serves as a basic storyline for interpreting data. With historical science, time always causes evidence to decay and increases the risk of some form of contamination. Forensics runs into this problem all the time. The fresher a crime scene, the better are the chances of finding the person who committed the crime because contamination and decay reduces that chance over time. Forensics benefits from the fact that it deals with recent history. However, other forms of historical science are not so fortunate in that they are dealing with the distant past. For them, contamination and decay are real problems such that they can even serve as excuses for why data does not match theory. The historical sciences of archaeology, paleontology, and geology are particularly prone to contamination and decay as well as conjecture and philosophical assumptions. This also means that the interpretation of evidence is highly dependent on the theoretical system being used. The result is that the same evidence can be evaluated by two different theoretical systems and produce radically different conclusions. This does not mean one person is stupid and the other smart. It just means that they are looking at the same data from different perspectives. It needs to be realized that the different theoretical systems are often based on different worldviews. When dealing with creation and evolution, this is where the real difference can be found. 
Creationists are looking at the data from a biblical worldview, while evolutionists look at the data from a materialistic, naturalistic, atheistic worldview. The big difference is that creationists recognize this fact, while evolutionists ignore and even deny it. According to the Bible, God created the earth and the universe about 6,000 years ago, earth time. We are told by the scientific and educational establishments that science proves the earth is about 4.5 billion years old and the universe is about 14 billion years old. So has science really proven that the earth is 4.5 billion years old and the universe is about 14 billion years old? The real answer is no. First of all, there are a number of lines of scientific evidence that indicate that the Earth and solar system are much less than 4.5 billion years old. Second, both the 4.5 billion year figure of the Earth and the 4.5 billion year figure for the universe are based on specific theories about the origin of these systems. Called the Nebula Hypothesis and the Big Bang Theory, they both assume a totally materialistic, naturalistic, atheistic view of origins. They both eliminate God as a starting assumption. Yes, the Big Bang was first proposed by a Roman Catholic priest, but he ignored God in his thinking. And in today's version of the Big Bang, any suggestion of any form of intelligence in the process is not allowed. The same thing goes for universal common descent evolution. It assumes a totally materialistic, naturalistic, atheistic view of the origin and development of life on Earth. True, Darwin was trained in theology, but he had long since turned his back on God and the Bible when he conceived of his theory. In all three of these cases, not only were these theories invented without any thought of God, but they were deliberately conceived for the purpose of dismissing the biblical account of creation. So it is natural that biblical young earth creation would run counter to these theories because they were intended to go against the Bible from their inception. The Bible is quite clear that there was a global flood about 4,500 years ago, give or take a century or so. That the Genesis flood was a global catastrophe is the most natural interpretation of the text of the Bible. Reducing it to some kind of local flood requires ignoring the plain text of Genesis 7 and 8 and other parts of scripture as well. The only reason for questioning that it was a global flood is to try to reconcile the Bible with uniformitarian geology. Uniformitarian geology did not come about as a result of godly men who simply could not find evidence for the Genesis flood. It was a result of a deliberate effort to get rid of the Genesis flood and explain geology without it. Charles Lyell was a deist who at a starting point did not believe the Bible and in fact hated it. He wanted to get rid of its influence. Today, uniformitarian geology is the establishment system. Though they do allow some catastrophic processes, the Genesis flood is still excluded as a starting assumption. Modern uniformitarian geology assumes a totally materialistic, naturalistic, atheistic view of Earth's origin and history. The Genesis flood and God are not allowed to even be considered, so it is natural that it and the Bible would disagree. One of the main attacks used against the Bible is the standard Egyptian chronology. Based on this chronology, it is claimed that there is no evidence for the biblical account of Jewish history, including the patriarchs in Egypt, the presence and enslavement of Israel in Egypt, the Exodus, the conquest of Canaan, and even the United Kingdom. Because of this, the claim is often made that these events never occurred and that the Bible contains mythology. The standard Egyptian chronology consists of 30 dynasties from about 3100 to 400 BC. This Egyptian chronology is based mainly on a list of pharaohs compiled by the 3rd century priest Manetho. His list of pharaohs includes the length of their reigns. A key assumption of the standard chronology is that these pharaohs reigned sequentially, but some seem to have reigned at the same time in different areas of Egypt, such as north and south. Not only was Mentho's pharaoh's list not intended as a chronological account of Egyptian history, but it does not agree with other 3rd century Egyptian sources. The standard Egyptian chronology is also used to date sites around the Mediterranean, so it has resulted in an unexplained Dark Ages. 
This and other problems have prompted efforts to revise the Egyptian chronology. Here is a straightforward chart of the standard Egyptian chronology. Note how it is divided into various periods, extending back to 3100 BC. Comparing this chart to the biblical timeline clearly shows a conflict because it has the earliest dynasties as predating the flood. This chart includes a revised Egyptian chronology that not only fits well with biblical account, but solves all of the other problems as well, including the unexplained dark ages in other parts of the Mediterranean. It also explains some curious water erosion on the Sphinx that cannot be explained by the standard chronology, because this revised chronology places the construction of the Sphinx within the post-flood ice age, during which Egypt would have received ample rain. It turns out that there is actually abundant evidence for the history of Israel as described in the Bible. The problem is that because of the standard Egyptian chronology, archaeologists are looking in the wrong place. Furthermore, the evidence that is there is dismissed as being related to Israel because it is not where the standard Egyptian chronology says it should be. One of the big arguments used against the biblical account is the claim that Moses could not have written the Torah, even if he were a real person, because the writing needed for it did not exist. Part of the problem is that the form of Hebrew we are most familiar with did not exist at the time. It is the script used by both the Mediterranean text and the Dead Sea Scrolls. It is known as modern Hebrew. This form of Hebrew script dates to about 900 BC, meaning that it was probably the script used by David and Solomon. Because this is the earliest form of Hebrew that was known when the documentary hypothesis was developed, its date is a common argument against the Mosaic authorship of the Torah. However, in an ancient Egyptian compromise at Sarabit al Haddam, another script called Proto Sidianic script can be found. It turns out to be an earlier form of Hebrew, and it is clearly much older than previous scripts. Furthermore, it is based on Egyptian hieroglyphics. This is a picture of the early Hebrew script found in the copper mine at Sarabit el Kadim. Here is an enhanced version of the text on the wall of this mine. Here is another use of this script near Thebes, the ancient Egyptian capital. Here is the modern Hebrew script alongside a chart showing early, middle, and late Hebrew. Here is the script from 1900 BC. It would be classified as Middle Hebrew. Here are the pictures that have already been presented of the proto sinaitic script. It shows a very close comparison to the early Hebrew script. Here is a better comparison of this script to our chart. The comparison to early Hebrew is uncanny. This can easily be the earliest form of Hebrew. This evidence is consistent with the alphabet being Israelite in origin rather than Phoenician. As long as the Israelites were in Egypt at the time the Bible says they were there. Sadly, because of the indoctrination of the documentary hypothesis and evolutionary thinking, many scholars dismiss this as being Hebrew, despite the fact that it is a perfect fit. This inscription traces the script to the time of the 12th dynasty pharaoh Anahaptat III. In the revised chronology, this would be the time of Joseph. There was also a 7 to 10 year famine during this pharaoh's reign, suggesting that Joseph himself may have been the one that invented this script. In looking for evidence of the patriarchs in Egypt, we probably will not find evidence of Abraham's short visit. Not only would his stay have been too short, but his significance in Egypt would have been too minor for anything to be found. However, Joseph and his brothers should have left some evidence, and there is some evidence that points to them. To know where to look, let's take a look at what the Bible says. Genesis 47.1 then Joseph came and told Pharaoh and said, My father and my brethren and their flocks and their herds and all that they have are come out of the land of Canaan, and behold, they are in the land of Goshen. 
Genesis 47, 11. And Joseph placed his father and his brethren and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt, in the best of the land, in the land of Ramses, as Pharaoh has commanded. By the way, the reference to the land of Ramses will be important later. Under the ruins of a city called Ramses are the ruins of an older settlement called Arvis. Arvis was from the 12th to 13th dynasties and was populated by a Semitic people and not Egyptians. The reason they are not generally considered the children of Israel is that it is hundreds of years too early according to the standard Egyptian chronology. At Arvis is a palace of the type that would belong to someone important. This would have most likely been a reward for a government official for extraordinary service to the nation. This palace has 12 pillars. The pyramid tomb had an ante chamber with a statue of the person buried there. The burial chamber had been broken into and the body removed. This is consistent with the Bible statement about the children of Israel taking Joseph's body with them when they left Egypt. The pyramid tomb had an ante chamber with a statue of the person buried there. The burial chamber had been broken into and the body removed. This is consistent with the Bible statement about the children of Israel taking Joseph's body with them when they left Egypt. In the entryway of this tomb is a statue of a Semitic man with a coat of many colors. Now who does that remind you of? The 12th dynasty was also a time of increased power for the pharaohs. Previously, the pharaohs had to deal with nobles called gnomes that ruled over local areas of Egypt. The need for their cooperation limited the pharaoh's power. This change during the 12th dynasty is consistent with these gnomes selling their land and themselves to pharaoh for food. There is also a canal that dates to the same period called the Waterway of Joseph. It makes sense to build such a canal if you are dealing with a massive famine. This actually connects Joseph and the famine to the 12th dynasty. So we have a palace at a Semitic settlement belonging to an important government official. The palace has 12 pillars and 12 graves behind it, one of which is larger and pyramid shaped, suggesting someone really important. This tomb had a statue of a Semitic man with a coat of many colors and it was broken into and only the body was removed. All of the details are a perfect fit to Joseph and his 11 brothers. However, this evidence is found in the 12th dynasty and not the 16th to 17th as indicated by the standard Egyptian chronology. So we have all of the right evidence but seemingly in the wrong time. This is a painting from the tomb of Keshnaphep of Benhassan. It depicts 37 Semitic speaking people who had come to Egypt possibly to trade. Here is a map of Semitic settlements that sprung up around Arvis, with Arvis the largest city in the area. This not only shows the presence of the children of Israel in Egypt, but the large growth in population while there. These cities are from the 12th and 13th dynasties. The area contains uniquely Semitic graves, as is evident by body posture and grave goods. The evidence includes uniquely Semitic tools. This evidence is also from the 12th and 13th dynasties. In the Bible, the Israelites were enslaved and forced to bake mud bricks with straw. This process is still used today. Construction using mud bricks with straw is found throughout Egypt. Here is an 18th dynasty painting of prisoners making mud bricks with straw. This shows that the author of Exodus was well acquainted with construction techniques in Egypt. The Bible speaks of the male babies of the Israelites being killed, and the Semitic graves support this. There is an unusually high spike in infant graves, along with an unusually high percentage of female adult graves. Also found in the same area and time are boxes containing the remains of male babies. This is such a parallel to the Exodus that it cannot be rationally dismissed. These are pictures of the Brooklyn Papyrus with the names of Hebrew slaves from the 13th dynasty. 
This list of slaves from a single estate has mostly female Hebrew names, consistent with the slaying of the Hebrew baby boys. No, this is from the 13th dynasty and not the 19th with Ramses II. This data is fully consistent with the presence and enslavement of Israel in Egypt during the 12th and 13th dynasties. It is a perfect fit to the biblical account. It's just not where archaeologists expect to find it based on the Ramses II mistake. A papyrus contains a copy of an Egyptian document called the Abomination of an Egyptian Sage, written by a scribe named Ipur. The Ipur papyrus is dated from the 18th dynasty, but the original dates from around the 12th to 13th dynasties. This document is strikingly similar to the 10 plagues found in the book of Exodus. Exodus 4, 9, and it shall come to pass, they will not believe also these two signs, neither hearken unto thy voice, that thou shalt take of the water of the river, and pour it upon dry land, and the water which thou takest out of the river shall become blood upon the dry land. Ipur 7, 5, Egypt is fallen to pouring of water, and he who poured the water on the ground has carried off the strong man in misery. Exodus 7, 20 and 21. And Moses and Aaron did so as the Lord commanded. And he lifted up the rod and smote the waters that were in the river, in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants. And all the waters that were in the river returned to blood. And the fish that was in the river died. And the river stank. And the Egyptians could not drink of the water of the river. And there was blood throughout the the land of Egypt. Ipur 2.20. Indeed, the river is blood, yet men drink of it. Men shrink from human beings and thirst after water. Exodus 9.6. And the Lord did that thing on the morrow, and all the cattle of Egypt died, but of the cattle of the children of Israel died not one. Exodus 9.23. And Moses stretched forth his rod towards heaven, and the Lord sent thunder and hail and fire rain along upon the ground, and the Lord rained hail upon the land of Egypt. Exodus 9.31. And the flax and the barley were smitten, for the barley was in the air, and the flax was boiled. Ipur 3363 and 713. Good things are throughout the land, yet housewives say, Oh, that we had something to eat. Indeed, everywhere barley has perished. Behold, he who had no shade is now possessor of shade, while est while possessors of shade are now in the full blast of the storm. Exodus 12, 39. And they baked unleavened cakes of the dough which they brought forth out of Egypt, for it was not leavened, because they were thrust out of Egypt and could not tarry, neither had they prepared for themselves any victual. Ipur 2, 5 and 2, 13. Indeed, hearts are violent, pestilence is throughout the land, blood is everywhere, death is not lacking. Indeed, men are few, and he who places his brother in the ground is everywhere. Exodus 12:30. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants, and all the Egyptians. And there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. Ipur 3:14. Indeed, laughter is perished, and is no longer made. It is groaning that is throughout the land, mingled with complaints. Exodus 12, 35 and 36. And the children of Israel did according to the word of Moses, and they borrowed of the Egyptians jewels of silver, jewels of gold, and raiment. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they lent them such things as they required, and they spoiled the Egyptians. Exodus 28, 17 to 20. And thou shalt set in its settings of stone every four rows of stone. The first row shall be Sardis, Topaz, a car carbonacle, this shall be the first row. And the second row shall be an emerald, a sapphire, and a diamond. And the third row shall be a ligur, an agate, and an emphel. In the fourth row, a beryl, an onyx, and a jasper, they shall be set in gold in their enclosures. Indeed, the plunder everywhere, 
and the servant takes what he finds. Indeed, gold and lapis, lazu, silver, turquoise, carnelian, amethyst, ehib stone, and are strung on the neck of maidservants. Thus we have evidence for the ten plagues from the same dynasties as other evidence for Israel and Egypt. The biggest mistake made in dating the Exodus has been the idea that Ramses II was the fear of the Exodus. When looking for evidence for the Exodus based on this claim, most researchers look during the times of Ramses II. Because there is absolutely no evidence for the Exodus during the reign of Ramses II, this has led to the claim that there is no evidence for the Exodus in Egypt. This error has been aided by famous movies about the Exodus, especially the Ten Commandments and Prince of Egypt. Furthermore, the fact that it gives scoffers an excuse for denying the Bible helps keep it going. The claim that Ramses II was the pharaoh of the Exodus is based in part on a wrong interpretation of Exodus 111. Exodus 111, therefore they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens, and they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Pithom and Ramses. Note that this verse is referring to treasure cities that the children of Israel built for Pharaoh and not the name of the Pharaoh. The fact is that Ramses was the name of a region of Egypt and not the name of the Pharaoh. Genesis 47, 11. And Joseph placed his father and his brethren and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt, in the best of the land, in the land of Ramses, as Pharaoh had commanded. Note that it is the land of Ramses, not the Pharaoh Ramses. This reference to the land of Ramses is more than 200 years before the Exodus, and so could not have any connection to the Pharaoh of the Exodus, and certainly not to Ramses II. The land of Ramses is mentioned three other times. Exodus 12, 37, and the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Sukkoth, and about 600,000 on foot were men besides children. Exodus 33, 3, and they departed from Ramses in the first month, on the 15th day of the first month, on the morrow after the Passover, the children of Israel went out with a high hand in the sight of all of the Egyptians. Numbers 33, 5. And the children of Israel removed from Ramses and pitched in Sakoth. All five of these usages of the name Ramses refer to locations and not to a pharaoh. Besides having the wrong time for the Exodus in relationship to Egyptian history, the tendency is to have the locations of both Mount Sinai and the Red Sea crossing wrong. Even conservative scholars tend to place the crossing around the Reed Sea rather than the Gulf of Suez of the Red Sea. One reason for the lack of maps putting it in the Gulf of Suez is the fact that the Gulf of Suez has no place where even parting the water would give the Israelites a place to cross. This is because the depth produces a canyon with no way across. Furthermore, centuries of digging at the traditional Mount Sinai have produced no evidence of the children of Israel. The only reason for considering this site, Mount Sinai, is that it was labeled such by Constantine's mother, Helena, as a result of a dream. Not exactly the best basis for archaeology. It turns out that there is plenty of evidence for the Exodus, the crossing of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel at Mount Sinai. You just have to be looking at the right place and at the right time. Sesostris III would have probably been the first pharaoh of the oppression, since he would have been the first pharaoh who would not have known Joseph. Joseph would have died 17 years earlier and been retired for decades before that. They probably never actually met. Amenhotep III is not known to have had any male children. His successor, Anemhet IV, may have been adopted. He had a daughter named Sebeka Nufu, who had no children and later became pharaoh when the only male successor, Anahatat IV, disappeared from Egyptian history. Anahatat IV is an enigmatic in Egyptian history. Based on Egyptian history, his father is not really known. His mother is only known as Hetepai, which in Egyptian means she who satisfied. 
His mother is known only from an inscription where she is given the title King's Mother. She is not called King's wife, King's daughter, or even King's sister. So who was she? There is a lot of confusion regarding his reign, with as many dates as sources. Furthermore, he seems to have simply disappeared from Egyptian history, with no tomb ever being found. Within the revised Egyptian chronology, the evidence points to Imhotep IV being Moses. In this case, he would have co-reigned for nine years with Imhotep III before discovering his true heritage and renouncing the throne. Hetepi would have been Moses' mother, Jochebed, referred to by the Egyptian meaning of she who satisfied, since she satisfied the need for a male heir to the throne. It is clear from Hebrews 11:24 to 25 that Moses renounced Egypt before fleeing. By faith, Moses, when he came to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. The facts fit Imhotep IV and Moses being the same person. Shebet Nefu, short reign, as the first female pharaoh, ended the 12th dynasty because she had no children. She most likely is described in the Bible as finding Moses in the Nile and adopting him as her son. Nefer Hoptep I is one of the last pharaohs of the 13th dynasty and most likely the pharaoh of the Exodus. He was succeeded by his brother, Sabeth Hoptep IV, rather than his son, Henekef. This fits with God killing the firstborn of Egypt. Also, his tomb is uncertain since his mummy has never been found. His remains are probably at the bottom of the Red Sea. The circumstances surrounding Neferheptep I are what we would expect for the Pharaoh of the Exodus, including the fact that Egypt was conquered not long after by the hoax without a battle. So where was the Egyptian army? They were probably at the bottom of the Red Sea. Most maps showing the route of the Exodus label the Gulf of Suez as the Red Sea, while labeling the Gulf of Akrabar as the Gulf of Akrabar. This implies that the Gulf of Akrabar is not part of the Red Sea. However, if you look at the second map, the entire body of water all the way down to the Indian Ocean is the Red Sea. If you look at the Gulf of Akrabar, you will see a peninsula sticking out on the Sinai Peninsula side, pointing towards Saudi Arabia. This peninsula is the result of the sedimentary deposits of a dried up river, as can be seen in this map. It also fits the description in Exodus, where Pharaoh mentions the wilderness closing in the children of Israel. It also explains why the children of Israel felt trapped by the approaching Egyptian army, not to mention Pharaoh's overconfidence. This peninsula is also a large flat area, perfect for a campsite consisting of a large number of people. So we have a place that looks like a good site for the Red Sea crossing. However, it would still be worthless if underwater there was a steep drop into the abyss. So to see if this is a viable location, we need to look underwater. And when we look underwater, we get a land bridge right at this location. The result is that if God divided the water at this location, there would have been a perfect land bridge for the children of Israel to cross over. This is one of two matching columns, one in Saudi Arabia and one on the other side of the Gulf of Aqaba, with inscriptions showing they were erected by King Solomon to mark the crossing of the Red Sea. He probably built them when he set up his navy in the area. 1 Kings 9, 26. And King Solomon made a navy of ships in Ezebur, which is beside Elah on the shore of the Red Sea in the land of Edom. If this were truly the location of the crossing of the Red Sea, we would expect to find evidence. Specifically, we should expect to find remains of the Egyptian army, particularly chariots. Here is one of the many chariot wheels found scattered across this land bridge. Here is yet another chariot wheel. This land bridge is literally littered with them. Here is a pair of coral encrusted chariot wheels still attached to their axle. So unless the Egyptians 
We're using this area for a massive chariot dumping site. This can best be explained by this being the site of the Red Sea crossing and the subsequent destruction of the Egyptian army. The fact that human remains have also been found across this land bridge further supports this being the Red Sea crossing because the Egyptian army was also killed here. Here is a corrected map of the path taken by the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt to the Red Sea crossing. The two main objections given to this site are the travel time needed for the children of Israel to make the trip and the current drop and slope of the land bridge. The current drop and slope of the land bridge is not a problem since 3,000 years of erosion would have changed it, making it deeper and steeper. The second objection is based on the fact that the Bible gives three campsites for the children of Israel between Ramses and the Red Sea, Sakoth, Ephem, and Migdal. The assumption is that this means the trip only took three days, when it would have taken seven to get to Nuevia on the Gulf of Akrabar. The problem is not only does the Bible not specifically say it took only three days, but they may simply not have fully encamped, but only stopped for the night. With these objections overruled, it is clear that this is still an excellent site for the Red Sea crossing, with plenty of evidence that it actually happened, as described in the Bible. Here are a couple of maps showing the location of a mountain in Saudi Arabia called Jebel El Laz. This mountain has abundant evidence for being the true Mount Sinai. The first map shows the path from Ramses to Mount Sinai, with the second map showing the correct location of the Red Sea crossing. Exodus 3.1 Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. Exodus 3.12 And he said, Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee, that I have sent thee, when thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. This suggests that Mount Sinai was in Midian, which is consistent with Mount Jebel El Laz being the real Mount Sinai. As you will recall, Moses was told by God to strike a rock to bring forth water for the children of Israel. Nearby, Mount Jabal El Laws is a split rock that shows evidence of water having flown from the split. Here is a close-up picture of the crack, and there is clear evidence of water erosion. The evidence is strong that this is the rock that Moses struck to give the Israelites water. Exodus speaks of God coming down onto this mountain in fire. And the top of this mountain, unlike the traditional site, gives every indication of having been exposed to extreme heat. As you can see, the top even looks like it has been burned. This evidence is even stronger when viewed from the top of the mountain. You can also see a large plain below where the children of Israel could have camped. This site also contains pictographs that link this site to the children of Israel. One of the things that makes further investigation of this site difficult, despite its location, is the fact that the Saudi Arabian government has fenced it off, making it a crime to actually investigate it closely. One of the pictographs is reminiscent of the golden calf that the Israelites built to worship while Moses tarried on the top of the mountain. Now, you could argue that such depictions are common enough that it could have been anyone, including the Egyptians themselves. This argument would be correct if that is all we had, but it is not. Here among the pictographs is one of a menorah, which is a distinctly Jewish symbol. Not only are they still used by Jews to this day, but it is reminiscent of the golden candlestick used in both the tabernacle and the later temples. This clearly Jewish symbol connects this site and the pictographs to the children of Israel. While it is still possible to try to find ways around this, the simple fact is that the evidence points to this site being connected to the children of Israel. Further support comes from the prophet Elijah. 
First Kings 19, 8 through 9. And he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights unto Horeb, the mountain of God. And he came hither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said unto him, What does thou hear, Elijah? Here is a cave that fits the description. It is just the right size for a person to take shelter from the desert heat and high enough to be safe from predators and other dangers. Here is where this cave is located on the mountain. If you are trying to hide from a wicked queen who is bent on killing you, it would be a pretty good place to hide. Now I will address some objections to Mount Jubal El Lawas being Mount Sinai. The claim is that Mount Sinai was not actually in Midian, based on Exodus 18.27 and Numbers 10.30. Exodus 18:27 And Moses let his father-in-law depart and he went away into his own land. Numbers 10:30 And he said unto him, I will not go, but I will depart to my own land and my own kindred. The assumption of this claim is that Jethro's land and kindred referred to all of Midian and not just the part where he happened to live. This also ignores Exodus 3, which implies that Mount Sinai is in Midian. So both the claim that Mount Sinai was in Midian and that it cannot be in Midian are based on unclear references. This means that you cannot use the Bible to say definitely one way or the other, eliminating this argument that Mount Sinai cannot be Mount Jabal el Laez. It has been argued that other altars similar to the one with the calf have been found in the area, but the presence of other features, including the menorah, connects it to the children of Israel. The simple fact is that none of the objections raised actually show that Mount Jabal el Loez is not Mount Sinai. They just give someone looking for an excuse not to accept it, that excuse. A strong piece of evidence in favor of the conquest of the land of Canaan by the children of Israel are the ruins of ancient Jericho. As with so much other archaeological evidence in support of the biblical account, because of the standard Egyptian chronology, it is often dated as too early to be associated with Joshua. Ancient Jericho had an inner and outer set of mud brick walls that made it nearly impenetrable by attackers. Excavation has shown that a portion of these walls had collapsed exactly as the Bible said, providing the children of Israel with a ramp going up into the city. This shows how God used Jericho's main defense against them. The ruins of the city also show evidence of destruction by fire exactly as the Bible describes. Here is a map showing where the walls have collapsed and where they had remained intact. They clearly collapsed in a manner that would allow an invading army easy access to the inner part of the city. Here we have an illustration showing house walls from the destroyed city of Jericho. They included houses between the inner and outer walls and houses that were literally on the outer wall as the Bible describes. Here is the tell of Jericho after considerable excavation. It shows just how large and fortified a city Jericho was. Joshua 7, 20-23 And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonian garment, and two hundred shekels of silver, and a wedge of gold, of fifty shekels, wait, when I coveted them, I took them, and behold, they are in the earth, in the midst of my tent, and the silver under it. And Joshua sent messengers, and they ran unto the tent, and behold, it was hid in his tent, in the silver under it. And they took them out of the midst of the tent, and brought them unto Joshua, and unto all the children of Israel, and laid them out before the Lord. Joshua seven twenty four through 26 And Joshua and all of Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, and the silver, and the garment, and the wedge of gold, and his sons, and his daughters, and his oxen, and his asses, and his sheep, and his tent, and all that he had, and they brought them unto the valley of Achor. 
And Joshua said, Why hast thou troubled us? The Lord shall trouble thee this day. And all of Israel stoned him with stones, and burned them with fire. After they had stoned them with stones, and they raised over him a great heap of stones unto this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Wherefore, the name of the place is called the Valley of Achor unto this day. Here is the heap of stones near Ai. The stick figure was added for scale. While it would take excavation of this heap to confirm that it is indeed associated with Achan, and even that could be a fruitless effort given the amount of time that has passed, this is still evidence consistent with the biblical account. This is the archaeological site of Maketir, which is now thought to be the ancient city of Ai, from Joshua 7 and 8. This is the hill to the north of Ai, where Joshua's army encamped. It is now called Jebel Abu Ammar. Ai city gate is in the front. Joshua 10, 6-8 And the men of Gibeon sent unto Joshua to the camp to Gilgal, saying, Slack not thy hand, for thy servants come up to us quickly, and save us and help us. For the kings of the Amorites that dwell in the mountains are gathered together against us. So Joshua ascended from Gilgal, and he and all his people of war with him, and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Fear not, for I have delivered them into thine hand. Thou shalt not a man of them stand before thee. Joshua 10, 9-11 Joshua therefore came unto them suddenly, and went up from Gilgal all night. And the Lord discomforted them before Israel, and slew them with a great slaughter at Gibeon, and chased them along the way that goeth to Beth Horon, and smote them at Azak and unto Malkedah. And it came to pass as they fled from before Israel, and were in the going down to Beth Horon, that the Lord cast down great stones from heaven upon them unto Azkiah, and they died. And they were more which died with the hailstones than they whom the children of Israel slew with the sword. Joshua 10, 12 through 14. Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day, when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel, and said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand thou upon Gibeon, in that moon, in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed, until the people had advanced themselves upon their enemies. Is not this written in the book of Joshua? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven, and hastened not to go down about a whole day. And there was no day like it, before it or after it, that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. Now there is evidence for this long day, and no, it is not a case of NASA computers detecting it. That is a myth. What we do have are legends from around the world of a long day and a long night, depending upon where they are in the world relative to Israel. This includes a long day in Asia, the Middle East, and part of Europe. There are also legends of a long night from the western side of Africa and the Americas. From the middle of the Pacific is a legend of a long sunset. The pattern is what we would expect if Joshua's long day had actually happened. As is often the case, the evidence for the conquest is there. However, based on the standard Egyptian chronology, it is in the wrong time, and so they tend to attribute the destruction of these cities to everyone but the one group of people who left us a record saying that they did it. Once again, when the chronology is corrected, the archaeological evidence falls into place. This is a chronology chart of the Judges. Note that there is some overlap, such that you cannot simply add everything up in Judges to get the time period. This is because 1 Kings 6 1 sets the time between the fourth year of Solomon's reign and the Exodus at 480 years, showing that there needs to be some overlap of some of the Judges. While archaeology does show the general situation of the Book of Judges, finding evidence of the specifics is harder. This is not surprising because Israel was basically a loose confederation at the time, with most of the actual political power being local. As a result, we should not expect the kind of archaeological evidence we should find for a kingdom. 
However, as usual, once the chronology is corrected, the archaeological evidence falls into place. Like other times in Israel's history, evidence for the United Kingdom, while present, is shifted in time according to the standard Egyptian chronology. When the chronology is corrected, the evidence for the prosperity of this period, particularly under Solomon, is present. The big problem is that much of what might be found, like major structures, were deliberately destroyed by later conquerors. This piece of pottery called Kwayefa Atskan supports the start of Saul's reign by parallels to the biblical text. It shows the need for rulers who will not oppress the poor and the stranger, and the need for structures to be put into place to protect the lives of the poor and the stranger. It includes the need for a king, the need for administrators and servants for the king, the commandment not to oppress but to serve God, the designation of a new leader, that is, a king. Radiocarbon dating of the site at Tel Etan date the site's establishment to between the 11th and 10th century BC, putting it at the time of David. The evidence suggests that Israel was being ruled from Judea during this period. This fits perfectly with King David. Here are ruins of David's palace found in the city of David, south of the Temple Mount. Critics naturally claim the dating of the ruins is uncertain. Here are stone stepped structures in the city of David at Jerusalem, at the top of which David is thought to have built his palace. 1 Kings 3 1. And Solomon made an affinity with Pharaoh of Egypt, and took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her into the city of David until he made an end of building his own house in the house of the Lord, in the wall of Jerusalem round about. This Pharaoh's daughter has long been a mystery, but the revised chronology reveals her identity to us. Neferbidi was a princess in ancient Egypt. She was the daughter of Pharaoh Tutmose I, sister of Hephthah and half-sister of Tutmose II. She is depicted with her parents in Hephthah mortuary temple. Hephthah would later go on to rule as Pharaoh. She is also a candidate for being the Queen of Sheba, who was described by Josephus as the Queen of Egypt and Ethiopia, and Hephthah is the only person in history that fits this description. Nefribidi vanishes from Egyptian history and is assumed to have died young. However, the revised chronology clearly makes her the pharaoh's daughter that Solomon married. There is a chart illustrating the divided kingdoms of Israel and Judah that followed the reign of Solomon. The inscription on this seal reads, Shema, servant of Jeroboam. The seal was that of a servant of Jeroboam I or Jeroboam II. 1 Kings 16, 23-25 In the thirty and first year of Asa, king of Judah, began Omri to reign over Israel. Twelve years, six years reigned he in Tizah, and he brought the hill of Samaria of Shemer for two talents of silver, and built on the hill, and called the name of the city which he built after the name of Shemer, owner of the hill of Samaria. But Omri wrought evil in the eyes of the Lord, and did worse than all that were before him. 1 Kings 16, 26 through 28. For he walked in all the ways of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, in his sin wherein he made Israel to sin, to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger with their vanities. Now the rest of the acts of Amari, which he did, and his might that he showed, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel? So Amari slept with his fathers and was buried in Samaria, and Ahab his son reigned in his stead. The Mesha stone was written by Mesdek, king of Moab. It speaks of Omri conquering Moab during the reign of his father. The following is a translation of several lines from this stone. Line 5. As for Omri, king of Israel, he oppressed Moab many years, for Chemosh was furious with his... Line 6. Country and his sons followed in his footsteps, and he also said, I will cast down Moab in my days, he spoke. Line 8, and he lived in it during his time and in the days of his sons, forty years, yet Chemosh. 
Omri and his sons ruled for 40 years. 1 Kings 16.23 says that Omri ruled 12 years, six of which he co-reigned with Tibna, and for six years he ruled as king of Israel. 1 Kings 16.29 says that Ahab reigned 22 years. 1 Kings 22.51 says that Ahab's son Ahaz ruled two years. 2 Kings 9.14-29 says that Ahab's son Joram ruled ten years, being killed by Jehu in his eleventh year. Now it's just a matter of doing the math. Six years plus 22 years plus two years plus 10 years equals 40 years. Line 18. Hearths of Yahweh dragging them before Chemosh and Israel's king built. Line 31. Sheep of the land while the house of David inhabited Horonim. These are extra biblical references to God and King David. The picture on the left is of the ruins of Ahab's palace in Samaria. The picture on the right shows the ruins of Ahab's court building. The Stella Shalmaneser refers to the battle at Quar Quar on the Ontas River. In 853 BC, Ahab and Ben-Hadad II joined together to stop an attack of Shalmaneser of Syria. The Stella mentions 2,000 chariots and 10,000 men of Ahab, king of Israel. This seal is inscribed with the letters J-Z-B-L. This seal once belonged to Ahab's wicked queen, Jezebel. This is further support for the biblical account. 2 Kings 15.29-30 In the days of Pekah, king of Israel, Telethapur, king of Assyria, took Iljon and Abath the Match in Jamna and Kadash in Hazor in Gilead and Galilee, all the land of Nephtal, and carried them captive into Syria. Confirmation of this is found in the annals of the king of Syria himself, Tiglath-Pileser the Third. Second Kings. 17, 1 through 2. In the twelfth year of Azaz, king of Judah, began Hasa, the son of Ella, to reign in Samaria over Israel nine years. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, but not as the king of Israel that were before him. The inscription on this seal is Adidai, servant of Hasia. Now for the southern kingdom of Judah. First Kings 14, 25 through 26. And it came to pass in the fifth year of King Rehoboam that Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem. And he took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. He even took away all, and he took away all the shields of gold which Solomon had made. Jean Shapalion, the decipher of the Rosetta Stone, erroneously identified Pharaoh Shashikha has Shashak of the Bible. Champollion found an inscription about Shashenke, the, the first pharaoh of the 22nd dynasty at the Temple of Karnak. Shashikha sounds similar to Shashak, so Champollion concluded that he was Shashak. With the biblical date of Rehoboam, has a starting point. Chronologists use methods list to outline the following three centuries of Egyptian history. This is how the chronological confusion came about. After all, they were off by four whole dynasties. Based on the revised chronology, the most likely candidate for Shushak is Tammuz III. What makes this significant is the fact that Tammuz III is known to have invaded Israel early in his reign, including a battle at Megiddo. In this context, the looting of Jerusalem makes sense and fits into the time period. 2 Chronicles 26-23 So Isaac slept with his fathers, and they buried him with his fathers in the field of the burial which belonged to the kings. For they said, He is a leper, and Jotham his son reigned in his stead. Here is a 1st century AD inscription reading. Here were brought the bones of Uzziah, king of Judah. Do not open. Here is part of Hezekiah's tunnel. It is over 18,000 feet long, and in Hezekiah's day, it was used to bring water into the city. 
It was a major factor in Jerusalem not falling to the Assyrians. What about Hezekiah's sign of bringing back the shadow on the sundial? It suggests the sun going backwards in the sky by way of a temporary reversal of the Earth's rotation. Now, it turns out that there are legends from around the world that support this strange event. Just as before, we have legends that are in just the right place for this to be a true event. We have legends of the sun going backwards in the sky, a legend of the stars going backwards from the Yucatan Peninsula, and three legends of the sun rising and then setting again. This fits the biblical account perfectly. This is a six-sided stone prism found in ancient Nineveh called Sennacherib's Prism. It recounts the invasion of Judah and supports the biblical account. Here is a collection of letters written on pottery from the biblical city of Latris. They confirm events mentioned in the Bible that occurred during King Zedekiah's reign. They also mention the names of biblical figures, what may be the prophet Jeremiah. Gemiah, son of Hilkiah, Jeremiah 29.3. By the hand of Eshiah, the son of Sharphan, and Gemiah, the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon, to Nebuchadnezzar the king, saying, And Gemiah, son of Shaphan, Jeremiah 36.10. Then read Barak in the book, the words of Jeremiah in the house of the Lord, in the chamber of Gemara, the son of Shaphan the scribe, in the higher chamber at the court of the new gate of the Lord's house, in the ear of all the people. Jazaniah, a Judean military officer, 2 Kings 25, 23. And when all the captains of the armies, they and their men, heard that the king of Babylon had made Gedaliah governor, there came Gedaliah to Mizpah, even Ishmael son of Nethaniah, and Johanna the son of Karas, and Sarah the son of Tehemadeth, the Naphtite, and Zaniah the son of Mechat, Thight, they and their men. Neriah, the father of Baruch, Jeremiah's scribe. Jeremiah 36 4. Then Jeremiah called Baruch, the son of Neriah, and wrote, wrote from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the Lord which he had spoken unto him upon a roll of a book. Matthiah, who Nebuchadnezzar appointed king of Judah. 2 Kings 24 17. And the king of Babylon made Matthiah, his father's brother, king, in his stead, and he changed his name to Zedekiah. The name Jeremiah is also mentioned and possibly refers to the prophet Jeremiah. In conclusion, so despite the claim that there is no evidence supporting the biblical account, the problem is not one of evidence, but of chronology. The problem comes from the fact that the standard Egyptian chronology does not fit the biblical account. However, once the chronology is corrected, the evidence falls into place. The Bible is supported by abundant archaeological evidence, but it is often being misplaced in history by a faulty chronology. The key is making the Bible the standard of chronology rather than Egypt. This is a good idea since the Egyptians have a history of not being totally honest with reporting their history, while the Bible is the Word of God.